So, hi, my name is Stacy Peterson, and I'm super happy to be here. I um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself since you don't really have a clue who I am. Um, the first is that I am a mother of several amazing children who I love so much when they're not with me. Um, I have um, written, I don't want to brag, but I have written three New York Times bestsellers. Um, they're still in my head, but when I do actually write them, I already know they're winners. They're going to be so good. Um, and actually right now, I, I'll be honest, I gained so much weight through COVID. I don't know if any of you experienced that, uh, that my dress is literally like a Pillsbury biscuit can right now, because the moment I go to unzip it, it's just, everything's going to go out. I'm sucked in really tight. So I got to make sure I don't move too much. Um, but really, I think the thing that I'm known the most for is that I've almost died a bunch. And people really get a kick out of that. I don't know why it kind of hurts my feelings, but I will be sharing that story with you. And I have to say that you do learn a lot about life when you almost die. So uh, here's an example. One of the very first things I learned from almost dying is that people say that laughter is the best medicine. And I am here to tell you firsthand that it's not morphine is because I have laughed and I have been on morphine. And I can tell you that there is absolutely no comparison whatsoever. I would take morphine any day over a joke. So just keep that in mind. If you have ran up in the hospital, <laughs> you don't want your nurses telling you jokes. You want the morphine. Um, but I, so I, one of the things that I did learn about life um, that again, I will share later on when I share my story is just the value of living the life that you have now, as well as you can, no matter what the circumstances. And it's hard to hear, especially if you are someone who's going through a challenging time to be like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be happy. Um, and so that's what today is hopefully for. It's to help give you some tips and tricks to lower your stress and improve your overall quality of life just by little things so that when those big things happen, you're able to basically stay afloat. I do. I like to think of it as um, basically I, I love to watch surfers. I don't know why I'm in Colorado because there's no surfers here. But I love to watch it. And when you watch a surfer, um, when they fall off and into the water, they don't drown. Uh, I do. <laughs> I can't swim at all. But if they don't, and it's because they have learned the skill over and over and over again um, to get back up on the board. Uh, because unfortunately in life, waves keep coming, don't they? Like we all think I don't know about you, but I, I still fall for it where I think, okay, when this finally happens, then I'll be happy. Anyone, anybody can relate to that? Like, you know, when I make the million dollars, <laughs> then, or you hear it, uh, I'll hear it like, when I finally find the one true love and I'm thinking, have you ever been in a relationship? Because it's just, you know, that no matter what in life, there's always something else that comes like waves. And so we tend to get knocked off that board. And what a surfer does is they just get back on it. And then they write it and they're able to see life in a different way. And that's what some of these skills for you are for, where if you feel like you're just drowning in stress or you're overwhelmed in the circumstances in your life, it's to help practice. If you practice these things, it's to help you get back up and stay afloat much quicker um, than if you didn't have the board and you had didn't have these skills. So that's the goal. Um, we're going to be talking about the seven habits of highly stressful people. And um, I'm going to ask you today that you will walk away and just pick one thing. I, one thing. That's all I'm asking. You can do anything you hear today. I would like for you to take one thing 
and say, I'm going to start implementing that. Can you do that? Raise your hand if you could do it so I could see it. Like you're going to make a commitment. Thank you. One thing, one thing. Okay. So are you ready to learn the habits? (laughs) The very first habit is not groundbreaking, unfortunately. Like I kind of amped it up. Like this is going to be a really big groundbreaking thing for you. I'm going to teach you all kinds of new stuff. Uh, I'm not. It's, (laughs) it's just proven over and over again. Um, Oh, and by the way, the same things that make you less stressed are the exact same things scientifically proven to make you more happy. Isn't that crazy? I think it's crazy. Here's the very first thing. It is drum roll exercise. I know. I told you it's not exciting. Uh, The studies show over and over again, as you know, that exercise is super important because it releases all these positive endorphins and it makes you feel better and it lowers stress. And I'm here to tell you today that that is fine for all of you. Um, But I am actually allergic to exercise. Um, I here's I am because here's what happens when I start to exercise. Um, my heart starts pounding. I feel like I can't catch my breath. Things start hurting all over. My face turns red. I break out in a sweat. And if you look up an allergic reaction on the internet, those are the exact symptoms. Exact. So I know that I am. I don't know if any of you guys are, but that's why I don't exercise. Um, Actually, I do, but I've never, I'm not one of those people. I know there's some of you out there who are like, why not? I love to exercise. Any of you willing to admit it? You're just like, you love to exercise. Yeah, I don't see a lot of hands. A couple. There's a couple brave people. I wish I was like you. I'm not. I have never once woke up and go, I feel like exercising ever. And I used to have a friend Uh, because this is how I switched to making myself. I had a friend and she was my food buddy. And if you don't know what that is, basically she and I would get together and we would eat unhealthy food and make fun of, you know, healthy people. That's what we did. And then she betrayed me and she went and she got healthy and she started exercising And one day I'm backing out of my driveway and she's running and I almost hit her with my car. So I finally, I was like, what happened? Like, why did you finally start to exercise? And this is what she told me. She says, well, I just realized I was never going to want to. So I might as well do it anyway. I was like, oh, that's actually, that's pretty good. (laughs) So I started it. I started thinking that, well, I'm never going to want to exercise. So I might as well do it anyway. And it worked so well. It had started spilling over in other areas of my life. Like I'm never going to want to work. So I might as well work anyway, or I'm never going to want to be your friend. So, you know, it, it just, it really works. So that was the mindset that I adopted to help me through it. But I think that when it comes to exercise, it's like, I don't know about you, but it's super overwhelming because you know, you're supposed to do it. You don't like it or you don't feel like it. And then you don't even really know where to start. Like I, I didn't even, it's like my sister's a marathon runner. Both my brother and sister were Marines and I have no idea what happened to me, but I genetically somehow missed that athletic gene. And she was like, well, you should start running. And I was like, no, Oh, she goes, well, you could always do yoga. And I was like, okay, running or sitting on a mat and breathing. And so I chose the sitting on a mat and breathing. Are any of you yoga enthusiasts in here at all? Nobody. Not, you're either scared, like so unengaged, or <laughs> nobody really does yoga. I don't know. I can't tell. Uh, <laughs> so I tried yoga. And what they say about yoga is that it is all about the breath which is really ironic because if you've ever done yoga, they never breathe ever. It's like an inhale and exhale. 
and I'm in the back. <laughs> like it's so hard. And I'm just going to be honest because I, I think we're mostly women in here. I'm going to be honest that I have done yoga where I just put it on YouTube and I will be watching the yoga person doing her thing on a mat and I'll look at it and go, those aren't real. I mean, she's laying on her back and there is no mudslide into the armpits because I can tell you firsthand that this right here is the only part of my body that can actually bend down and touch the floor. That is it. Yoga is hard. It's hard. So I really encourage you to adopt the mindset, even though it sounds negative of, hey, you're probably never going to want to exercise. So you might as well do it anyway. And once you do it several times, uh, even if it's just 10 minutes, you could set a 10 minute timer going for a walk, whatever, pick whatever, is that you have to look back and ask yourself, have I ever regretted doing it? And I have to say for myself, I never want to. I don't always do it. But when I do, I've never regretted it. So it's just one of those things where you kind of just got to suck it up if you want to be happy. And just by moving more, by moving your body and releasing those endorphins. And then I just learned this two weeks ago. It's a brand new thing for me. I'm like, that's so cool. I did not know that when you're stressed, you know, you could, you kill brain, your brain changes. It kills brain cells. Um, and literally changes like a lot of stuff in there. And, but you can have baby neurons that grow in your brain new. And I was like, I want baby neurons. I mean, don't you like, <laughs> wouldn't you love like to be smart again? Like you were when you were young. I was like, I want baby neurons. So I looked up and the number one way to grow new neurons is exercise. Is that not so crazy? And it takes three months. So it's kind of like having a baby. So I'm like, oh, I got to exercise for three months if I want to have baby neurons. So that is something too, that could be a motivator for you. If you're like wanting your brain back, you've got the fuzzy brain, or you just have been stressed for so long, you feel like you just can't think anymore. Grow some baby neurons by exercising. Okay. So some of you, that could be their one thing. You're going to start committing to even just 10 minutes, just 10 minutes of a walk. That's not too bad, right? Number two, when it comes to stress is relationships. Studies show over and over again that people who have relationships with other people, significant others, whatever, that are healthy are significantly happier and less stressed, which is really ironic because if you think about what stresses you out the most, it's other people. Am I right? It's usually, you're usually fine until somebody else does something or doesn't do something. It's other people. Uh, but it's other people that you need to have a higher quality of life. I, I will tell you the most valuable relationship um, in my life that I'm just so grateful for is that of my children, I, being a mom. And how, how many of you are parents out there? Two. <laughs> or everybody's just scared, like I said. Yes, yes. Uh, you might be able to relate. Um, it's kind of like exercise, actually, where you hate it. And then you're like, oh, I guess it wasn't that bad when it's done. Um, <laughs> you hate it in a moment. But I, I, I thought when I was young and I knew everything that I was going to be an amazing mom. I did. Uh, I thought that I was going to be one of those moms that gather their children around the table at night in their homemade clothing. And we would have homemade dinner with homemade bread and homemade butter from the cow that I milked out back. And then I thought I'd be one of those cool homeschool moms that teaches their kids math lessons in the grocery store. And I can tell you, the only math lessons my kids have ever heard in a grocery store is I am counting to three. That's it. That's it. I, you know, 
Uh, and I knew in COVID, because I've worked with kids for many years and, you know, the kids are great. It's the parents, right? <laughs> right? It's the, it's the parents. Uh, but I knew that when COVID hit and I needed to basically teach my kids, my son, uh, that I was in trouble. Because uh, I had tried something way back when, when the kids were small, called family time. I don't know if any of you are familiar with family time, but this was kind of really popular for several years. And it was where, once again, you were supposed to gather your children around in a living room or the kitchen table and communicate with them, no negativity, and instill in them values and character traits. And I can tell you that that is not at all what family time looked like at my house. This was family time at my house. Mommy, what? Mommy, what? Mommy, what? You said we were going to have family time last night and you didn't. And that means you lied and God doesn't like it when you lie. We are having family time. When? Right, right now. We're having family time right now. All right, everybody, get down here. It's family time. We're going to learn about patience. Get down here now. Patience is get off your brother's head. Patience is get off your brother's head. Patience is mommy, what? Mommy, what? Mommy, what? Does God have bones? <sighs> God is like a chicken nugget. We don't really know what he's made out of, but we love him anyway. That was family time at my house. It did not go well. And neither did COVID because my youngest is now 17. And I would just text him being like, hey, are you alive <laughs> in your room? Like, are you breathing? Yes. Did you do your homework? Nothing. No response. That was like my full, my full day communication with my teenagers. Because you know what, teens and tweens, they they're they're hard. I had the brilliant idea uh, one year that I wanted to take. At this time, we had three teenagers and two tweens, and I was like, I know. Let's take them on a road trip where they can see where we grew up. So we took all five kids in that minivan across 14 states. Yeah, 14 states. And uh, that's why we're divorced. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it was not fun. And just being with teenagers, like I said, the communication part is like super hard. So I remember asking people like, how do you successfully raise a kid? And they would say communication. So I found that there was really only two forms of communication with teenagers. I mean, I love talking to, oh my goodness, three-year-olds are like my favorite age. I love like they communicating with them is so much easier than a teen boy because they only communicate one way. And that is through the grunt. Basically anything you ask them is responded with, uh, like, how was your day? Uh, did you meet anybody new? Anything exciting happened? Everything's just a grunt. Unless you ask them to do something like, hey, I need you to do your homework or, you know, uh, I need you to clean your room. And then it's the grunt, but it's like this elongated side grunt. It's like, and I discovered that all grunts mean the same thing. It's why are you bothering me? You're ruining my life. That is what the male teenage grunt, uh, that's what it is. Uh, that's their form of communication. But then with the teenage girls, their sole form of teenage communication is the eye roll, the rolling of the eyes. And all eye rolls mean the exact same thing. You're so stupid. You don't know anything. That's what they mean. Well, in our house, we didn't allow iron rolling because we found it disrespectful. But I found that it was so ingrained in the teenage female body that they would start to roll their eyes and they would catch themselves and it would come out like in physical form and look a little like this. <coughs> they do it with their arms. Like that's what it was. Uh, but my favorite thing, the thing that cracks me up the most was that teenagers use their age as the sole logic to be allowed to do anything. What do you mean? I can't, I'm 16. Like, 
I would love to use that logic in real life. I would love to walk into my boss's office one day and go, what do you mean I can't have a raise? I'm 46. Like that would work so well, but it doesn't in real life. So I do. I, I, I love being a mom. I'm not that great at it. Um, but then, you know, you have relationships in your life where you don't get to choose. And a lot of times that's um, extended family. Um, I come from a large Italian family. And we love to get together and play family games. Um, any of your families do that on the holidays? Anybody do the family game? Nobody? Nobody plays? Okay. okay. Well, I saw one hand. Yeah. Uh, so the family game that we love to play is the uh, silent treatment game. I don't know if any of your families do that, but yeah, we play it so well. <laughs> like one of my, some of my family, it's been years. They're still not talking. They are amazing at it. Um, with my ex-husband, their family didn't do that. They were the elephant in the room game. And that's fun until you find out you're the elephant and then not so much. So, <laughs> you know, you have people in your life that you don't, always get a say. So what do you do with that? What do you do with uh, a parent who is just so obnoxious or a coworker? Don't, don't look <laughs> like, keep your eyes, keep your eyes on the screen. If they're sitting next to you, what if there's a coworker or just somebody who just bugs the snot out of you and stresses you out and you feel like they're ruining your quality of life? Well, unfortunately, I, uh, we know, but we kind of don't know that we, we can't change anybody else, right? We can only change ourselves, which is a real bummer. Cause I really tried, uh, hence once again, why I have an ex-husband, I really tried to change him. Um, they don't appreciate that by the way, just a little bit of <laughs> advice. Uh, so you can't change anybody else. You can only change yourself. So what does that look like? So what I have found is that when somebody really bothers me, like they just bug me or they make me mad, I have found that it almost always comes back to this one thing, unmet expectations. I expect something of them behavior-wise, knowledge-wise, what they do in a day or not do, and they haven't meet that expectation. Here's some examples. One is if you had kids, your toddler, you're getting ready to go out the door and your toddler takes off all their clothes and are standing there naked and you're now going to be late and you're frustrated because like, we're trying to leave. Like you expected them to know you don't do that. Like I'm in a hurry. You, need, you know, to think like a grown up. They don't know, but it's frustrating. It was an unmet expectation that you're going to be able to walk out the door. Or, you know, like you get to, uh, you know, somebody makes a mess. I hate that. I'm like, the unmet expectation is, you know what? You should clean up after yourself because you're putting this on me and a burden. But the truth is, they may not know that that's an expectation. And with work, sometimes it's like, you know, if you're, you're in an office or a classroom setting and you're there on time, in fact, you're there 10 minutes early, like clockwork. And the moment the clock is, you're on, you're ready. And then you have that coworker who saunters in all the time, three, five minutes late, they're talking to everyone and it bugs you because you were there on time. So the unmet expectation there is that they should be exactly like you. They should be there early, on time, doing exactly what you do. But what you don't recognize is that they're bringing something different and unique that you don't offer into the work environment. And that people like that sometimes tend to be more relational or be more of a caretaker and find out how everybody's doing before they actually get to work. So there's more of an emotional and relational connection that they add that you don't, but you have this expectation they should be exactly like you. Or it could be the opposite. It's like, why can't this person just back off and be nice? Like, why does this person have to be there like on time every time? It's that unmet expectation. Just be like me. 
So if you can kind of think about that the next time somebody gets on your nerves or you're thinking about somebody right now, the last time you got mad at them, was it an unmet expectation? And did they know it even existed? Because sometimes we just don't communicate it. It's like, I expected you to not make a mess so that I, you know, didn't have to clean up after you and you didn't do that. So next time, can you, they may not know it exists. They may not know you feel that way or that's something that you need. So that communication factor is really important. And then, you know, when it comes to relationships too, um, there are definitely times where you need to set boundaries and that's hard. Uh, you know, and sometimes you just can't sometimes, like I said, if it's work or it's family, it's, it's very hard. Um, but just knowing how to protect yourself, knowing what your triggers are with that, um, in order to be able to just, this is who they are. They're not going to change. I'm not going to let them affect me. I'm not going to let them have a say in my self-worth or I'm not going to let them change my day um, because that's just who they are and they don't know any better. And that sometimes it's freeing. Sometimes it's like, okay, you know, you can let that person off the hook of being just like you or expecting them to behave a certain way. Um, and then, you know, the cool thing with relationships too is the relationships that you get to choose the ones of people you want to be around, there is a saying, it is not scientifically proven that the five people you're closest around uh, are the five people you become like, which when you're looking around <laughs> the Thanksgiving table, a lot of times you're like, okay, this is why I'm so messed up, right? <laughs> it's the people you're around. So the people that you get to choose, one of the things that I have done in my life is that I am naturally drawn to people who are better than me um, in that there's a character trait or a quality that I wish I had that they're so good at that I naturally want to be around them so that I can learn from it. So an example is I have a close friend who is the most amazing mom and she's just brilliant. Like the, she's just gifted as a parent. And I like being around her because I learn from her. I have another friend who is an amazing businesswoman, like so smart, makes all this money. Like she's just really intelligent. And it's like, well, I want to be like that. And so those are the people, like they have a character trait or they're just, you know, really compassionate or they're just really smart in the way they live their life. The relationships that I choose, that's kind of what I personally am drawn to because what happens is I learn from them. I'm not using them. I genuinely like them. They're genuinely my friends, but they, I want to become more like them in that area. And I find that it's true that you start thinking the way that the people that are around you are. So if the people around you are really negative, you will find yourself thinking negative. Am I correct? Right? If you are around people who are hyper positive, you're annoyed. No, if you're around people who are hyper positive, you will find over time that you become more and more positive. So just keeping that in mind when it comes to those choices of, you know, of your time of who you're going to spend your days with. And then the last thing with relationships is that uh, I almost died, as I've mentioned, and we'll explain more as I've mentioned. But before I almost died, I used to say things like this. I used to say, oh, oh, man, I have to hurry up and get them to school. And then I got to go to work. And then as soon as I'm done, I got to get off. I have to, you know, go get so-and-so to practice. And then I have to make sure I'm home in time to make cook dinner. And then I have to get that little under. I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to. And then I almost died. And I didn't almost get to see my kids being grow. And the mind shift that happened for me was uh, rather than saying I have to, it went to I get to. So it was like, wow, I get to be the one to take them to school. I get to be the one to make them a meal. I get to be the one to deal with their teenage angst, me. And, you know, it even passes on with your significant other. Like, 
I get to be the one of all the billions of the people on the planet. I get to be the one to pick up your underwear off the floor. That's me. I get to do that. (laughs) But it is true. It changes your mindset, even moving from I have to, to I get to even with your job, because, you know, especially through COVID or just in different parts of the world, you know, work is hard and it's stressful sometimes. And there are challenges always, but how many people how many people in the world just want a steady job and you get to have one, you get to go to work, you get to help in this manner, you get to help these families. That's cool. That's, it's not, I have to go to work. It's no, you get to, and it gives you this feeling of gratitude and joy just from switching those two words, have to get. So that is one of the things that you could commit to of trying to do that with your mind. So you ready for number three? <laughs> You're like, I'm ready for a nap. Um, I'm going to take a drink of my mouth is dry because I'm talking so much. Mm. I won't drink in the microphone because that's so disgusting when people <laughs> do that. All right. This one I love to talk about. This one is called flow. Have any of you heard of the term flow? And I'm going to talk about the chick on the progressive commercials, just in general, with like people talk about mental wellness or anything like that. Flow. Oh, see, this is why I like talking about it because most people don't know about it. So here's what flow is. Flow is. is when you are doing something productive. Uh, and it could be something you enjoy that takes a little bit of brain work and you lose track of time. And when you're done, you feel kind of good. Like you're energized. You're not exhausted. So any of you do sing or play a musical instrument? Couple of you. Yeah. Have you ever practiced your instrument or sang? and lost track of time. And when you're done, you felt good. Has anybody experienced that? Yes. I see your hand. Thank you. I was looking too. I was like, she better raise her hand. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Yeah. Here's some other ways people experience it. Um, Some people do it through um, handicrafts, like knitting, crocheting, Uh, Some people experience it through painting Um, and some people experience it. uh, I used to experience it in the office filing way back a thousand years ago when we actually had this thing called paper. Um, I would start doing the filing and I would find that my brain kind of turns off, um, but I'm doing something active and I would look and I've had a completely lost track of time. You know, the one thing I, you know, the one thing I don't miss about filing anybody who ever get a paper cut off those vanilla, (laughs) those vanilla file folders. Oh my gosh. I do not miss that. (laughs) Um, so I want you to think about, have you experienced that? And if so, what were you doing? Like, were you painting? Were you gardening? Were you reading? Um, again, I, ha- I have a friend, she experiences it through cleaning and ugh, I wish I had that gene too, but she's, she was so, I was like, oh, whatever. She told me, she goes, I was so bored in the hospital after I had my son that I started cleaning the hospital bathroom. I was like, Really? Cause my daughter's 21 and I still have not cleaned my bathroom. Like I just don't have that. But some of you may experience cleaning. It's like, it relaxes you. You're doing something. You feel good when it's done. Again, I don't feel that way. I feel cranky the entire time, but some of you do. So what the studies have shown is that people who experience flow two or three or more times a week are significantly happier and less stressed. So unfortunately, Um, uh, my encouragement to you is that if you are not sure 
uh, how you experience that, then pay attention, pay attention um, when you're at work and pay attention when you're at home. The next time that happens where you're doing something and then you look up at the clock and you're like, oh my gosh, it's already this. Not like today, like right now you're, you look at the clock going, oh my gosh, it's only been 30 some minutes. <laughs> so it's basically the exact opposite feeling. We're like, it's done already. Uh, <laughs> that is flow and pay attention. And I encourage you to continually add that to your life. Now people are like, Oh yeah. Like I got time for that. I'm already so busy. I don't have time to sit and blank, but the cool thing about flow is that it's usually, it has to be productive. Like it's yard work or it's improving a skill or a hobby that you love, or it's cleaning your house or it's organizing, you know, a, a, a room. I don't know. Whatever it is, um, you're getting stuff done. So it's not like you're taking time away from things. You're also accomplishing things, which frees up your brain of that whole list of things, that you know, you're supposed to be doing that are in the back of your head uh, that you've been putting off. It frees that up as well. There is one caveat. Unfortunately, television doesn't count. I know. And if you found you've down three bottles of wine and you are feeling really good right now and you have completely lost track of time, that is not the kind of flow I'm talking about. Okay, that is not it. You got to pick something healthy. <laughs> So I would encourage you to, again, that could be your one thing, learning how you experience flow, or maybe you already know, I already, I do, I flow when I go for a walk. Okay. Well, that could be the one thing that you are going to take the 20 minutes a day to do or whatever. So then uh, we're going to move on. And this one is about, you know, people talk about mindfulness. Um <laughs> We'll talk about more of that later when we get into uh, uh, more of just like the practical. Because basically, what I'm doing, oh, I should have I should have set this up in the beginning. That would have been helpful. Hey, today's agenda. <laughs> Some of you would have appreciated that. Those who are list makers, what's the plan? Uh, here's the plan. Um, Forty minutes into it, is that I'm going to give you the general talk, and then we're going to do a little bit of practicing some of the awkward stuff. Uh, for any of you who are introverts, I'm an introvert. So I hate it when a speaker gets up there and is like, okay, I want you to stand up. I'm like, I don't want to talk. <laughs> I don't know if any of you are like that. I don't want to talk to my neighbor. I don't want to stand up. Don't make me do anything. I'm going to make you do it uh, just so that you can practice that. But I also recognize for all of you fellow introverts, uh, how much you don't appreciate that. <laughs> so we'll get to that at the end. Okay. We are on mindfulness. So Mindfulness, you hear that word a lot. And we're going to talk about that, like what that actually looks like at the end. Um, but it's taken me forever to get on the mindfulness bandwagon because <laughs> basically it's where you become aware of your surroundings uh, rather than being in your head and just being present in the present. I'm not naturally wired that way. And every time I tried it, it's like, I'm in traffic. My kids are fighting in the back. I'm like, I'm trying to be present in the present. I'm like, how is this relaxing? Because this is what's stressing me out. <laughs> like I'm now aware of everything and everyone that I don't like, and <laughs> you know, it's happening around me. So it just took the longest time for me to say, how is this not making it more stressful? But I didn't start there. I tried. And then I really kind of thought through some of that. And I thought, you know what? I, um, I can't do mindfulness that way. So what I did for myself was uh, this question. So often we are so busy or we are so overwhelmed or just our thoughts. Are, we have such anxiety or such stress we're trying to deal with all these things and we are not aware of the gift of today, correct? And after I almost died, 
I like, I, I keep saying it, but I won't tell you, I haven't told you the story. Um, after I almost died, one of the things I started to ask myself, because I discovered that I did not want to waste my life. I didn't want to waste the days that I had been given. I wanted to live them to their fullest. So what did that look like? It really was just a simple question. This question was, have I lived today? Have I lived today? So this is what this looks like. I would encourage you to maybe set your alarm for, I don't know, 10 minutes before you go home from work. Could be that. Or it could be in the evening after dinner, like seven o'clock, something. You set your alarm. And when the alarm goes off, you ask yourself, have I lived today? Have I just survived? Have I just existed? Or have I actually done something that makes me feel alive? And if the answer is no, the reason I like thinking about that right before you get off work is you still have time. And if the answer is no, then you have time to do something about that. Now, what does it mean to have I lived today? Does that mean I'm supposed to jump off a bridge? <laughs> no. Um, it means something that is meaningful to you in your life and that makes you feel like you have a purpose or you've done something good. So it could be um, that you're going to send a text to someone to tell them how much you appreciate or love them. It could be you being extra nice to the person in the grocery store or letting somebody in, uh, in the traffic lane. You're just, you're going to do like something nice, something contributing value to this world. Um, it could be something as simple as looking your significant in the uh, person in the eye for 10 minutes or it could just be going for a walk. It could be doing something where you experience flow, like you just, you feel alive when you sing. Then do it. Then add that in. Um, here's what happens when you start living and taking control rather than feeling out of control over just a small moment, just a small moment. It's kind of, like I, um, I like to think of it as a 20 minute rule. So when my kids were young, there was too many of them and <laughs> the house would be destroyed by the end of the day. And we set a timer from eight to eight twenty, and that was their pickup time. And they were required to pick up whatever they could in those 20 minutes and it transformed the house and it transformed my attitude. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it was helpful. So here's a thought uh, when it comes to living. Again, sometimes we just exist. And also sometimes we just endure. Like we just kind of don't take charge of something. I would like to encourage you to take 20 minutes. It does not need to be every day. It could just be uh, this coming weekend. You're going to take 20 minutes and you're going to take control of one thing that you've just been enduring, you've just been existing with. Here's, here's an example. Um, you have that entryway. If your entryway looks anything like mine, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have that entryway that has 400,000 shoes, 50 days of mail, <laughs> a couple of pillows, your shopping bags, keys, dirt, uh, coats from two years ago, and it's all there on the floor. Is anybody? Is anybody have or the bench? And you, you know, you keep thinking, oh, someday I'm going to fix that. And then you don't. So I'm encouraging you to take 20 minutes and clean it up. Uh, it could be the screen door is broken. It could be the rotten French fries under your car. Uh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> you can smell them sort of now. And you know, they're there. Just take the 20 minutes to pick them up because here's what happens again. It's just like, have I lived today? I'm just going to take one moment and take charge of that. So I feel like I have control and I'm, then it's going to spill over into a little bit longer of now I'm going to take 20 minutes and start taking control in these things that I don't have to just live with or endure. How many of you know someone 
that took control of their health. Their health was not good. And they started exercising. And now five years later, they are down at the gym teaching exercise classes. We all know somebody like that, right? Do you know somebody like that, that has done that? And that is now their passion. They're now healthy and they teach it. Oh, um, I'm going to tell you how they started. They started by, they just put their shoes on and then they walked out the door and went for a walk, a 20 minute walk. They just, they put their shoes on. They made a choice. They put their shoes on. They went and I said, I'm not going to live like this anymore. They took 20 minutes and they went for a walk. That's how it starts. It could be, you know, somebody with your finances, your finances feel out of control. We all also know somebody who had, you know, financial hardships and they are struggling. And then they took the time and they sat down for 20 minutes and they made a budget and they made some choices. And now that's what they teach or that's what their passion is because they took, they made a choice. They did the work. They took the 20 minutes and they changed their life. I'm telling you that 20 minutes can change your life. When you stop existing, stop enduring, and you start taking responsibility and action over certain things. Now, one of the things I do not want you to do (laughs) is come home and bust open the front door and go, all right, you got 20 minutes to get out of here. I have just been enduring you for the last 10 years. Don't do that. (laughs) Um, That might require a little bit more thought. Um, You know, you may need to do that, but that, that is not a 20 minute thing. Okay. I'm talking small. I'm talking small. So if you know something already in your mind that uh, A, makes you feel alive, going for a walk, being kind to someone, um, practicing something that you love. I I encourage you to do that every day. Just even for, it could be short. I encourage you to start scheduling in, even if it's once a month, 20 minutes to take control of something bigger. So because what happens is, is it just keeps spilling over because once you feel like you have control over um, your day, uh, whether or not you feel good or not, and then you're taking control of your environment of like your home or your car, or your workspace, or you're taking control of your health, you're ta- it spills over and you'll find that it kind of becomes this way of life where now you're moving forward in other ways. You're taking control over the things that you can control, which is really just you. We can really only control ourselves. Um, So that could be the one thing you're going to pick, the one thing. Uh, It could either be the 20 minutes or it could be the have I lived today. It could be both. You could, you're very welcome to be an overachiever and (laughs) pick more than one. But I'm just saying that is an option. We're going to move forward uh, to the next one. And this is where I'm going to share my story. Uh, When it comes to stress and challenging times, I do feel for me, um, the biggest lesson that I learned was that your pain is priceless. And this, this is what I want to share. So, um, Some of you may be going through a challenging time right now. It could be with your health. It could be with relationships. It could be with your finances. It could be with your children. It it, it could be with, you know, I think I, maybe I said your health, but uh, something in your life is hard or it's just a lot of those things are happening at once and you're struggling. And when somebody gets up here in front of you and is like, well, just be happy just go for a walk and you won't feel so bad. Um, you, I have experienced this where you kind of just want to punch them in the face because it's like, excuse me, do you know what I'm going through right now? Do you know how I feel? Uh, cause I can tell you a 20 minute walk ain't going to do anything for me right now, which it kind of does, but we'll get to that. Um, I just want to acknowledge that. I first want to acknowledge and say, that I so understand 
and that that's not wrong. It's okay to feel that way. We went, as a whole, we went through a lot in 2020. And um, my story parallels that. So here's where, so I am going to tie it into you and what you've experienced over this last year and a half. So I'll give you the long version. Well, and it's kind of long. Uh, <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night in 1975. No, uh, I was uh, raised by hippie parents, which means that I was born in a one room cabin with no running water or electricity. I was potty trained in an outhouse and we uh, moved to the big house where we all five lived. And that big house was 800 square feet. And we were in the middle of nowhere in the Cascade Mountain Range of Oregon. I had one neighbor and they were a mile away and the rest was Bureau of Land Management. And we did the thing where you raise all of your own food. And uh, my dad always had a shotgun and I've eaten everything from when he told me I ate porcupine. It was like, really? <laughs> I've eaten pretty much anything you can shoot. Um, <laughs> so, and many things you can grow in the ground. Um, and I had, uh, my school was very rural. So my high school, junior high and high school, the total combined population in the school was 70 students, seven through 12th grade. And I had this really long bus ride to get to and from school. Cause we were the last kids to be dropped off. So it was an hour and a half every day. And I would get bored and I would start to make up stories and characters in my head. Now, I didn't really watch TV. I had no idea about pop culture. I remember the day, I think I was like 16 when we got a microwave. So <laughs> I was a little out there, right? Uh, unaware of certain things that a lot of other kids were aware of. I didn't know what acting was. So it was actually not till my junior year because my school was so rural, we did not have the arts. We had band. Um, and that was it. I had an English teacher pull me aside and said, Cece, have you ever thought of acting? And I was like, I don't even know what that is. So what she did was she gave me a monologue and then she drove me two hours one way to a competition. And I did this acting monologue and looking back, it was terrible, but I did this monologue and one of the judges pulled me aside and said, Stacy, how long have you been acting? And I said, today. <laughs> So she told me about this program where they would take 60 students from around the world and they would intern them in the summer um, at this professional world-class theater with the actors and the sets and all of that. So she encouraged me to apply. I did. And I got in and that was my first experience with theater and acting and arts just in general. And I loved it. I was like, what is this? I went back home and I was a senior and I thought, well, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to be a teacher. And it was the same acting. It was the same English teacher who took me to another acting competition uh, my second time. And I won a full ride scholarship to study theater in college. So I did. And I was, I had such bad stage fright. I still do. Uh, that I remember my very first play. I couldn't even look the other actors in the eye. I thought I just, I thought I was going to die. Uh, it took, took me weeks to be able to even just look at them and say my lines. Um, I did well. And then when I graduated, I started acting and started doing some things. Uh, and I also got married and my, um, so my first husband, he, uh, he, I, I don't know why I'm pausing. I, <laughs> I'm like, this sounds really dramatic. Um, my first husband, he decided that he didn't like the whole acting thing. And so I didn't act actually for 15 years, kind of a long story, but I just, I was like, okay, I'm married. I'm committed. I, I'm just not going to act. So I did teach acting. Uh, I started theater school, work with kids, taught them acting. Um, but it wasn't, uh, I started writing and I stumbled into clean comedy. I didn't know what comedy was. I started performing clean comedy. Then um, I, when I was 30 years old, my first husband got very ill. Uh, he was diagnosed with a very serious illness. And at the time I had a one-year-old and a four-year-old at home. And, and then I was running and then I was teaching kids acting 
And just in a matter of weeks, my whole life just turned upside down because he got sick so fast. Um, for the next three years, I was working sometimes two or three jobs at a time, sometimes 70, 80 hours a week, just to keep food on the table. And then I'm trying to keep the kids and just everything in order. And that was a time where you just exist. There are times in your life where you are just in survival mode. You don't have time. It is what's required of you. And you just do whatever it is that needs to be done. And I did that. And I, I didn't cry for three years. And I, I long since made up for that. I remember having a moment going, I think not crying is unhealthy. <laughs> so I went into my closet and I hid in there and I was trying to think of something sad. And it, I was so emotionally dead. That it was nothing. And I know many of you have experienced that where you're just doing the day to day, day after day after day. And you're just, you're, you're just literally surviving, literally existing. I ended up going through a divorce because, um, that illness began to affect him mentally, unfortunately. And I ended up needing to leave that marriage for the safety of myself and my children. Um, thankfully he is still alive, which the doctors are shocked at. And I'm thankful for my kids sake that they can have a relationship with him. But, um, I, I basically did, he was too sick to be a parent really. So, um, I had a positive attitude about it. I'm like, it's okay. You know, this is just life because nobody is ever like, Hey, when I grow up, I want to be a single mom. Nobody says that. Uh, and there I was, but I'm like, okay, well, this just is what it is. And, then it'll actually be 10 years ago, this July 29th, on July 29th, 10 years ago, I was building a children's musical theater set and I stepped on a rusty nail and it was no big deal. He'll fine. Uh, I had a tennis shot. I just been in the Dominican Republic working with kids. It was not a big deal. Um, the week that my divorce was final, I was signing over the paperwork to the house to him and I started not feeling well. And uh, then I almost died. I don't remember much after that. <laughs> I was in the hospital for three weeks. And uh, what had happened was that bacteria had gotten into my bloodstream and settled into some bones and joints in my back and it became infected. And I had gone into septic shock. And I remember having the moment of, huh, I think I'm dying. And I had a couple thoughts. The first one was, what you always hear about relationships. You wish that you had spent so much less time on things that didn't matter. And you had made the space in your life, more of it for the people that you love and care about. You wish you had spent your time valuing relationships more. That's so common. You always hear that. I experienced that. The second thing was, I was like, I kind of got bad. I was like, oh, what? That's it? Like you just work really hard and you stress and you try and then you just die. Like what? Like I was so mad. <laughs> well, thankfully I didn't die, uh, which is good because that would be really creepy right now if I had. I did not die. Um, but when I left the hospital, I couldn't walk and uh, I left in a wheelchair and because I was in the wheelchair, it's kind of a long story, but I lost my job because uh, it was not handicap friendly. So basically three weeks time, I had lost my home. I had lost my marriage. I had lost my health. I had lost my ability to care, care of my children. I had lost my financial stability and the people at my work were a really good support system. And so I felt like I had lost my support system, but I was like, it's okay. I still had a positive attitude. Oh, you know, it's okay. It's just a season. And then I started not, but I never felt right. And to make a short story long, the infection came back five different times, uh, through several years. And, uh, every time I would go into septic shock and almost die and the nurses would come in or the doctors would come in the next day and they would say, wow, you almost died last night. And I'm like, then why am I here? Like that was kind of my thought. Uh, I'm still here. Why, why am I here? Um, and I've actually, I'm written up in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, because they don't know why they could not kill that infection. 
So it's like not the kind of famous you want. I don't recommend it. Don't go that route. I, <laughs> uh, but um, so I've had like one time I had 12 weeks of daily IV antibiotics, then surgery where they cut out all the bone and uh, four weeks to the day I, I had that surgery, it came back and I almost died. So what happened over time was I eventually completely fell apart, basically. 